I, th I thought it was an advert for a washing machine. <laughs> and, you know, we were going to have one of these sort of greener-than-green um, sort of bylines for this. Well, welcome um, to this, what is, I think, one of the great events of the society, um, the um, uh, Michael Faraday Lecture. And um, we've got a great speaker tonight, and so I'm going to say a few words about him. Um, but welcome to everybody here and to those of you in the dining room, because although we're at capacity here, um, I believe we're also at or close to capacity down in the dining room too. So, um, Frank, you're very popular. Already we can tell that. So tonight's talk is entitled The Asymmetric Universe. It's given by... Um, Professor Frank Close, and he is, of course, the winner of the 2013 Royal Society Michael Faraday Prize. We're not going to clap him just yet. It will happen a little later. Now, this prize, very important prize for us, is awarded annually for excellence in science communication, and it recognises a scientist or engineer whose expertise in communicating scientific ideas in lay terms, is exemplary. Recent winners include uh, Professor Jim Alkahiley, Colin Pillinger, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who I was just sitting in front of, uh, Marcus de Sotoy, and last year, Brian Cox. Um, Frank Close, this year's winner, is Professor of Theoretical um, Physics and based at the University of Oxford. Um, he also gained his PhD at Oxford, but he didn't spend the rest of his life there. Um, he spent, um, had a postdoc period at Stanford at the Linear Accelerator and then at CERN, uh, became deputy chief scientist and head of um, theoretical physics, physics at the Rutherford, Rutherford Appleton, and later distinguished scientist at the Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee. And from 1997 to 2001, he was head of communications at CERN, and I have to say, CERN is pretty good at communications. They're always banging the drum. Got to keep all those countries interested in spending all that money on magnets, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, um, the, Frank is obviously um, known to many of us, a noted particle physicist, um, written many papers, involved in a, uh, 200 research papers and a dozen books, won the British Science Writers' Award on three occasions, I cannot say more. Professor Frank Close, please come to the podium. Thanks. I was amused what you couldn't see on the bottom here when you came up with the washing machine. It was washing MP came up. <laughs> well, uh, this was from the summer exhibition last year, and many of the British universities that are involved in the LHC at CERN, put on the expo. And uh, for tonight, um, I was going to wear the Higgs boson shirt, but my elder daughter told me that I would look like I'd worked at home base, so I decided to <laughs> not to do so. Um, the uh, talk could be called Peter Higgs, Life, the Universe, and Almost Everything, and I intend to speak for exactly 42 minutes to make that be the case. <laughs> On Twitter, it saves one syllable if you call it the lopsided universe, and I now make an apology. Actually, the title I'm using is the unsymmetric universe, and I apologise for ruining the English language, but I hope the reasons will become clear as we go along. So symmetry, balance and harmony, you, you know it when you see it. And there's this belief that somehow if you follow symmetry, you will find how nature really works. I don't know if it has to be like that, but it seems to work that way. The message I will show, first of all, is that when you see symmetry, sometimes there are surprises. But most things in nature are not symmetric, even though at first sight they might appear to be. This is the, the west front of Peterborough Cathedral, where I come from. And it looks symmetric, mirror symmetric at first sight, but then if you look behind the front, you see that there is a tower on one side and no tower on the other side. And just to do an experiment straight away, how many of you feel that you want there to be two towers or no towers, but not just one? And how many are happy with it as it is? And how many of the latter group are scientists? 
That's the trouble with being a theoretical physicist. Your theories disappear so fast when you put them to experimental <laughs> test. Right. Thank you all of those who got the right answer. <laughs> Um, but you know, there you have asymmetry, but the message of this is why, and asymmetry begets asymmetry. In fact, the answer to this is, I know, because I was told as a very young child, that after they had built the first tower, they realised that if they built the second tower, the West Front would collapse. And so th that is true. Um, so that is the reason why you have an asymmetry. The question, why did they build the tower on the left, if you like, the tower on the north side first, well, why not? It could be an answer. But actually, this is an example, perhaps, of where one asymmetry begets another. If you look carefully, you will see the shadows inside the arches. Of course, the sun is in the south, where we are. And so if you build the north tower first, you're in the sunshine the whole time. If you build the south tower first, you build the second one in the shade. I, I just made that up, but it's an example of how following asymmetry might lead you to interesting conclusions. Now, symmetry, um, for the mathematicians, sort of a rather boring but clear definition, if you perform an operation on something and it stays the same, it's symmetric. So this little ball sitting here, if you rotate it around, the image looks the same always. We say it's symmetric under rotation. And this ball sitting on the top of a hump is also symmetric under rotation for a brief moment because, of course, you know what happens next. It's going to roll off. It won't stay there. But we managed to capture it in that brief moment when it did. And this is to give me the, the basic idea there are two ways that symmetry sort of enters. One is stable and one is unstable. And in the best traditions of the Royal Institution, I now do the demonstration. If you can bring the camera onto this. So this piece of apparatus here, I'm a theorist, <laughs> this piece of apparatus demonstrates, you know, I drop the ball into there and it sits happily in the base. There we are, great. Right, so I, I, I put the ball into here and it sits happily in the base. That is an example of complete stable symmetry. But if I now, now in the old days you had a lab assistant who did the next bit. <laughs> if I now turn this over, and I put the ball on the top, of course you know what happens, but for a brief moment that is still radially symmetric. It looks the same from all directions. The moment I let go, at random it will end up, in this particular case it landed up down here. And of course if I rotate this around it will look different. So that is an example, if we can go back to the, the, the slides, of unstable symmetry and stable symmetry. Stable symmetry will survive as long as the universe does. Unstable symmetry will not. Nature might like symmetry, but the trump card is stability. That's the golden rule. And the golden rule is this. If you have unstable symmetry, you will end up with stable unsymmetry. That is why I'm using that horrendous word. The point being that the ball, which started off completely radially symmetric, drops down to somewhere at random. It's like roulette. You know, on a case-by-case -case basis, you don't know where it'll end and you lose your money. Spend all night and it will end up everywhere on the average. So that is the example which is permeating huge amounts of things in nature, including the Higgs story. But I want to show you many examples of this. So we'll start with Peter Higgs. And uh, 2012, before the famous boson was discovered, I was interviewing Peter at the Edinburgh Festival, and I started off by saying to the audience, it's much harder to be a theoretical physicist than to be Beethoven or Shakespeare. Because in Shakespeare or Beethoven, change a few words or change a few notes, you still have a wonderful work of art. Change just a couple of symbols in the equations of the Higgs mechanism, and it doesn't work. And the point is, that's what's the difficulty of being a theoretical physicist. You can write beautiful equations, but if nature doesn't do it, it's useless. It's experiment that decides. And that is why I was saying that Peter Higgs had a unique feature out of many people who had this idea back in 1964. He alone drew attention to the way to experimentally test the whole idea. So there we were before the boson had been discovered. 
And I said, so in 1964, you were writing these equations on a piece of paper, and as a result of this, we now have 27 kilometer ring of magnets underneath the Swiss countryside, whirling protons at almost the speed of light head on into each other, so that when they collide for a very brief moment in a very small volume, they make an intense heat similar to what the universe itself was like just after the Big Bang. And we have these wonderful cameras that record what happens with state-of-the-art electronics filling them, the size of battleships. They produce wonderful images that you could use as works of art and put on the wall, but these images are actually telling you what's going on in a very profound way in nature. And this is not one of the experimental collaborations. It is the number of people in one of the collaborations that happened to come to one of the meetings. And there are four collaborations like this. So the sum total people that are working on this as scientists is in the several thousands. Not to mention the engineers and technicians that built the machine, the detectors, and the whole infrastructure. And so over the whole course of time, the total cost of this is about 10 billion euros. And I said, Peter, so as a result of writing those equations, it's cost 10 billion euros. If tomorrow you found a mistake, would you tell anybody? <laughs> well, we now know that there wasn't a mistake, that the boson is for real. But at that stage, we didn't know that. Well, so then the boson was discovered the following month. And incidentally, I think, you know, for those of us in the field who watched it happen, it was an incredibly powerful emotional moment. The idea that, you know, in 1964, scribbling equations on a piece of paper, and 50 years later, an experiment shows one of these great mysteries, that mathematics somehow knows first how nature works. Later on, we do an experiment and discover it for ourselves. It's one of these profound feelings. But as the announcement was made and the evidence was shown, it then became clear that what we had sort of believed in our hearts for years or even decades was now known to be true forever. A very profound sense came over and many people were in tears. And I wouldn't have been half surprised if at that moment a thunderbolt had come to the CERN auditorium roof and Charlton Heston's voice would have been berating us for sort of trespassing where we had no right. It's a, but it's a very profound sense that science sometimes, once or twice in a lifetime, you somehow know nature and it's a very humbling experience. Anyway, before this, um, I had spent quite a time researching this whole 50 years of stuff and I wrote this book and The Economist very nicely had the following comment. The Nobel Committee would be well advised to read Mr Close's book before making their decision, so no pressure there then. Um, but what was interesting was that after the boson was discovered, and then of course there's a lot of discussion around in the media and so forth, there were several people who had had some of the idea, and you can at most have a prize awarded to three. How do you select three theorists out of the group? Then there's the experiments and everything else like that. And uh, I was at a dinner at Imperial College, um, last summertime, and uh, Lars Brink, the chair of the physics committee, asked me, he said, uh, so, oh, what do you think about all this? And I said, well, this was after dinner, uh, and I said, uh, well, I think actually this is a triumph for engineering. The machine, the detectors and so forth is really a triumph for engineering, and we now have the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, which is going to be an analogue, hopefully, of an engineering version of the Nobel Prize in, uh, in merit. And that if the creators, the designers, the constructors of the LHC uh, in some measure were recognised by that, I think that would be very appropriate. The experimental discovery of the boson itself, uh, you have to choose how you're going to identify who should really be credited. But I thought that the experimental discovery could be recognised with the physics prize. And then I noted Higgs, Anglaire and Tom Kibble, who I will mention later, to win the prize for chemistry. There is a reason for that. And he then said to me, if that happens, I will nominate you for the Peace Prize. <laughs> Which I didn't get, uh, because they didn't get the prize for chemistry, but Rutherford did. Uh, so I then showed, back in 2012, uh, with, with Peter on the stage, this slide from 1912, Rutherford and the Nuclear Atom. And one's immediate thought is, oh, the point here is to contrast that picture of thousands of experimentalists today with just one guy discovering the nuclear atom in this experiment uh, at Manchester, which is, of course, one possible way of interpreting this. But the thing that I was astonished by was this, that from 2012 back to 1912 was, of course, exactly a century. 
it's roughly half of that time that since Peter Higgs and co came up with their idea and the whole idea being proved correct. That from today back to Peter Higgs's idea is the same span of time as from Peter Higgs's idea to the discovery of the nuclear atom itself. And it was that that struck me, the huge time spans that are involved, or if you like, how recently it is that we understood that atoms are made this way. And the question of what does this Higgs business do, the common parlance is it gives mass to everything, which is not actually true. Most of our mass is locked up in the atomic nucleus. And that has nothing at all to do with this Higgs business, as we will see. It gives mass to the fundamental particles, like the electron, which you find on the outside of an atom. Now, why is the hydrogen atom the size that it is? In part, it's driven by the strength of the electrical forces that hold it together. But the sense of scale, why it is not that big or that big, but this big, is proportional to the mass of the electron, which whirls around on the outside. If the mass of the electron were heavier than it is, hydrogen would be smaller. If the mass of the electron were lighter, hydrogen would be bigger. If the electron had no mass at all, hydrogen would be infinitely big, which is a way of saying it wouldn't exist. So the mass of the electron is what gives a size to hydrogen. It turns out that it's rather indirect. The masses of the quarks that seed the proton in the middle are the things that cause nuclei to be compact. So the compact nuclear atom that we have known since 1912, we now know why it has that structure. It is because the fundamental quarks on the electron gain their mass through this mechanism. So that is in part why when I said the prize for chemistry, I wasn't actually making a complete joke. So now let's look, however, at that hydrogen atom to see an example of symmetry, but symmetry with a surprise. And it's this. We are held together by electrical forces. The negative charges and the positive charges of electrons and atomic nuclei attract and build up atoms. But overall, there's no electrical charge left over. At long range, it's gravity that rules. And that's because the negative charge of the electron precisely balances the positive charge of the proton. So that's an example of a symmetry. Now, why a symmetry with a surprise? I mean, if you're an accountant, you say, well, it's obvious. You, know, you add one, take away one, no big deal. But with uh, due respects to one of my daughters, it is easier to be an accountant than a theoretical physicist, as we shall now see. <laughs> and it's this. You see, the electron, as far as we know, is one of the basic letters of nature's alphabet. There's nothing smaller than it that we know of. If there's a Morse code, we have yet to find it. The proton, however, is complicated. It's made of little things called quarks. And these quarks carry fractions of electrical charge. They don't look like that as far as we know, but the, the up quark and the down quark have charges positive 2 thirds and negative 1 third in units where the proton overall has plus 1. So this is the hydrogen atom, not the scale. The single electron on the outside is negative. These quarks cluster in threes, never twos or fours, but threes. And the fact that on the average, each of them has about one third of electrical charge causes the proton to miraculously counterbalance the electron. Now, is that an accident? I'll take another test here. How many people think that's an accident or is it a clue to something? So who thinks it's a clue to something? Very good. <laughs> You're winning. How many think they have the answer? <laughs> Pity, because if you did, I'd, I'd invite you to come out with me afterwards here and share it. But this is an example of asymmetry, which at first sight appears obvious, negative and positive balancing, gives you a clue that there is something going on here. And we don't know what it is. So in the space of just 10 minutes, I brought you to a frontier question that we don't know the answer to. The symmetry of electric charges hints that there must be some relation between electrons and quarks. And at the moment, we have no clue as to what it is. So it's a symmetry with a surprise. Of course, when it comes to the mass, there's a huge lopsidedness that the electron only carries about one part in 2,000 in the total mass. Most of the mass is in the middle. And it's very massive in the middle because the little quarks are gripped in a very small region. And the price of them being gripped there to make protons and neutrons in the nucleus, it turns out, is a lot of energy. And energy E is mc squared. The big mass of the protons and neutrons is because of the energy gripping those quarks in the middle. It has nothing at all to do with Higgs. You have this massive asymmetry. 
And it's good because it's the masses of the nuclei that sort of in solid matter sort of lock them in place. And then the little flighty electrons can waft around and do chemistry and biology and so forth on the outside. So that is an asymmetry that's useful. But it now raises a question. Why is it that all electrons are negatively charged and all protons are positively charged? All that we seem to care about is opposite charges attract to hold things together. Why couldn't we have positively charged electrons and negatively charged protons? It would work just as well. And that brings us to the world of antimatter, because positively charged analogues of electrons are known. They're called positrons. And if anybody here has had a PET scan, it's positrons that have been used. Antiprotons are less uh, common around, but we can make them at CERN and use them. So the basic particles of antimatter have been known for decades. Paul Dirac, again, a mathematician appealing to symmetry in his equations, discovered that the symmetry, the balance of the equations, wanted there to be these opposites. And then, three or four years later, they are discovered. This was another example of how the maths knows. So there you have a beautiful symmetry. Matter and antimatter in perfect symmetrical counterbalance. How many people here are of the Star Trek generation? Fewer. How many people here read Dan Brown's Angels and Demons? Please nobody put your hands up. <laughs> so you know that when matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate into energy. And you can imagine them playing the film in reverse the energy in the first moments of the Big Bang turning into counterbalanced matter and antimatter. And our best experiments suggest that that is how things were. And yet, today, some billions of years later, that is what the observable universe appears to be. It is a complete lopsidedness. All matter that we are aware of has negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons. The antimatter, if it exists, we have never found it. Whether this is a hint that there is deep down some fundamental difference, some lopsidedness in the basic rules of matter and antimatter themselves, we don't yet know. If there is, what is it and why? Or whether they are indeed perfectly balanced at the particle level, but it's an example of an unstable symmetry because the annihilations, well, there'll be some that miss and get left over, and you will have clusters of matter which happen to be hundreds of millions of light years across and we happen to live in one of them. And there'll be antimatter clusters elsewhere. We don't yet know, but this is an example of a lopsidedness that is necessary for there to be anything at all. But why it is, we don't know. So at least we've got the conditions to have life. We've got some matter left over. And 150 years ago, Louis Pasteur said, I can, well, he said it in French, but I can even imagine that the existence and structure of all living creatures is a function of cosmic asymmetry. He really, I think, was talking about mirror symmetry here. It's interesting, again, that's 150 years ago. That is only three times longer than Higgs writing his paper. So here we have uh, the example, you know, the spherical embryo after uh, some years ends up as the famous uh, apparently symmetric human that Leonardo drew. Uh, but actually that picture is not symmetric. I don't mean that you know, the feet have been turned sideways. But if you look carefully, you see how observant Leonardo was, that the left testicle is hanging lower than the right. Um, now, gentlemen, you don't need to go out and check now. If you do, um, check, of course, the mirror image, but it doesn't matter. There is not a total correlation, but this is the ex or an external manifestation of a profound internal asymmetry in the bodily organs. For example, this, that the stomach is on the left and the liver on the right. Not for everybody. For about 1 in 20,000 people, you have complete what's called situs inversus. All of the organs being mirror inverted. And as far as human health is concerned, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if your organs are all mirror inverted, you have exactly the same health characteristics as most people do. With one exception, that you're more likely to suffer problems with surgery. And <laughs> this, this is not what you think that the surgeon opened up the wrong side. It's actually a bit more subtle than that. I was talking to a surgeon recently uh, on holiday, a man of my generation, 
from Boston uh, Medical Center in the States. And he had done gallbladder operations. He'd done two gallbladder operations a working day for 40 years. I thought, you earned your money. But the point was this. In the whole of that time, he'd done the order of about 20,000 operations. And on one occasion, he had operated on somebody with situs invertus. And the point is this. I mean, you know, he knows he's been told which side to open up. But the organ itself is mirror inverted. So that here is a person who has done 19,999 operations doing do 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 automatically like tying your shoelaces, who now has to do it all mirror inverted. I mean, you could get a left-handed surgeon to do it for you, except surgical instruments apparently are always for right-handers. But you see the problem. That is where the surgical problems can happen. It is because everything is mirror inverted. Of course, this begs two questions. Um, why is the heart on the left and not on the right? Why isn't it symmetric in the first place? Well, why it's not symmetric in the first place is because actually at the level of the heart, the heart is doing an asymmetric job. Now, I'm way above my pay grade here. I know that there are people who are being very polite and not screaming at me, but anyway, that the heart has to pump oxygenated blood to the whole of the body. So that's a powerful pump that's needed. The blood that comes back without the oxygen needs to be sent to the lungs, which are nearby. So that only needs a little pump. So the heart has got an asymmetric job. Nearby lungs on one side, the whole body on the other. I mean, that, I presume, is just an evolutionary thing, that why waste energy having the lungs far away? So that is an example of an asymmetry. And then it's a, a plumbing problem. Once you've got an asymmetry in there, putting all the other bits and pieces in uh, gives you asymmetry. But why it should be this way rather than that way overall, um, I don't know. I don't know if anybody does. But it's not true for everybody. As I said, it's only one in 20,000 that goes wrong. But when you come down to the level of the molecules of life, then it does get very interesting. Because life is built on carbon, and carbon has this wonderful property of having, if you like, four legs that it likes other atoms or molecules to attach themselves to. And the simplest example of this is to have four hydrogens making methane, and they form this sort of tetrahedral structure that you see on here. That's what you have if all four are the same. Imagine that all four are different. Now, these might be simple molecules or whole chains of molecules, but we're just focusing on one carbon atom with the tetrahedra coming out. And you see now that there are two ways that you can do it. You can have them, as you see it on the left, or the mirror form on the right. An example of one of these, well, milk or mirror milk, is mirror milk fit to drink by mirror humans, maybe. Um, amino acids, for example. Here you have a simple amino acid, and it can exist in two mirror symmetric forms held together by electromagnetic forces which do not care between left and right. And yet, living things make use only of one of these. So here's another example of complete lopsidedness. Why? I don't know. And I don't know whether anybody has a, an agreed opinion on this. But it could be another example that, you know, at the pure molecular level, you have got this symmetry, but it is unstable with regard to living things, where you have got to reproduce and procreate. And if you have got to find a mate whose uh, DNA, if you like, is called the same way as yours rather than opposite, that's inefficient in an evolutionary sense. So this itself could be an example of an unstable symmetry which has become a stable unsymmetry. Or not, as the case may be. Let me move to something safer where I do know that unstable symmetry turning into stable unsymmetry is the rule of the game, and that's gravity. Gravity, the law, Newton's law says, you know, that the force of attraction between two masses is proportional to the masses. It's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. But it doesn't care about direction. All directions pull together the same. So that has the effect that things being pulled together by gravity will form spheres. And here you have an example of a spherical galaxy, a beautiful example of that. But not all galaxies are spherical. You have these beautiful images of spiral galaxies. Now, if this was the only galaxy that you'd ever seen, and you were trying to deduce the rules of the law of gravity from this, if the student said, oh, this makes it look like gravity acts in a plane, you would probably have to agree and tick the box, got the answer right. But we happen to know that the fundamental law of gravity is spherical, 
And yet here you see something which is almost in a plane. And this is an example of, stable, uh, of unstable symmetry turning into stable unsymmetry. Why do I say unstable symmetry? Well, that picture is a picture we've taken today. Imagine what it might look like 100 million years into the future. All those stars will be collapsing inwards under the force of gravity. And to maintain that spherical structure, they've all got to be in just the right place that they keep heading towards each other, and that's very unlikely. And they've got to not be disturbed at all by any other galaxies around that might sort of give them a little tweak. At the end of the day, it's exceedingly unlikely that you maintain that spherical structure forever and you end up with more stable systems. But there is more than that one spiral galaxy in nature. If you go and look at the night sky, you see them pointing every which way. And this is the example, again, of what happens when you go from stable, uh, unstable symmetry to stable unsymmetry. The ball can land anywhere, but over enough throws, it will land in all possible places. The, the memory of the rule is preserved overall. And you see it here also, that if you plotted where all of the spiral galaxies in the universe are oriented, they would be oriented through all three dimensions. So the fundamental three-dimensional symmetry of gravity is remembered over the whole collection on the average, but on a case-by-case -case basis, it gets lost. And that is one of the general rules of this. And it's a rule that's been known for hundreds of years. I mean, Buridan, the philosopher, several hundred years ago, considered this conundrum. He imagined uh, a donkey that was completely symmetric, precisely midway between two identical bunches of carrots, and therefore by the symmetry of the situation, he argued, it's impossible for the donkey to choose the carrots on the right relative to those on the left, therefore it will starve to death. And if you're a philosopher, that's the sort of conclusion that you can come to. <laughs> and of course, we, we sort of laugh, we know it wouldn't happen. But why wouldn't it happen is more interesting. You can say, well, something would happen to disturb the donkey. But you're introducing something to the back door when you do that. And that is the sort of thing that I imagine perhaps people might have wondered even in the starting demonstration. I was saying that nature will always take the unstable symmetry and turn it into stable unsymmetry. And you're going to say, well, that's because you didn't put the ball carefully enough. And I say, well, let's, I mean, you're probably right, but let's imagine what's called, I mean, theorists live, love doing experiments in the mind, which can't be tested. Let's imagine that we had a perfectly engineered spherical ball on the top of a perfectly engineered spherical hump made of perfectly spherical atoms and we've got the atoms perfectly lined up on top of each other. Well, the trick here, of course, is the catch is at room temperature. What is temperature? It's things moving around. The hotter you are, the more violent they're moving. So these atoms are actually moving around. And so at random, you, know, you can't keep them there. OK, you say, let's go to absolute zero, where they're all frozen and not moving at all. Now something very profound happens. Quantum uncertainty the one bit of quantum that everybody's heard of and none of us understand, but it's the way that the universe is. You cannot both localise something and know at the same time what its motion is. It is in principle impossible, even at absolute zero, to have two atoms sitting perfectly on top of each other and be perfectly at rest. They will be moving somewhere at random. And so quantum rules themselves in principle, will make that ball drop. You cannot preserve... I get my unstable symmetry. That's right. You cannot preserve unstable symmetry. The quantum will necessarily force you to the stable situation and the symmetry gets lost. And that is, I think, the general rule. Now, I've used words like quantum and things. Let me just say one thing. There is a free app that uh, I worked on with Science Photo Library a to Z of particle physics, if you go to the App Store and search A to Z of particle physics, you can find much more about all the things I've been saying here, like the names of experiments, the names of great scientists, little mini biographies, what all these particles and everything else are. So go and search that and it'll cost you nothing. And just get it because your students might be getting it and answering the questions from it and you can find out. 
where they got it from. So what has this got to do with Higgs and, and all of that? Well, it's this, that the electromagnetic force is what we are seeing each other as a result of, that electromagnetic radiation is coming into your eyes off me. And in quantum theory, electromagnetic waves come in little particle bundles d -d 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 -d, called photons, and they have no mass at all. Now, in the heart of the sun, there's another force at work. It's the one that's turning the protons of hydrogen, the fuel, by a series of processes into helium, the ash, and radiating spare energy in, in the process. And this force we call the weak force, just to give it a name, because it's very feeble compared to the electromagnetic. It's a good job, by the way, that it is feeble. In fact, it's so feeble that the sun is only just managing to stay alight. That is what has enabled it to be there for five billion years, enabling evolution to happen and us to be here. It is feeble, we now know, because the analogue of the photon, the quantum of the electromagnetic radiation, has an analogue here. The quantum of the weak radiation is called a W boson. Identical in all respects to the photon, but for one thing, it is massive. And we know that it's the mass of the W boson that causes that force to be feeble. We know that because the measurements that have been done at CERN and other places over many years show that if the W boson's mass was nothing, just like a photon, the strength of that weak force would be the same as electromagnetic force. In fact, there is the hint of a balance between these two forces. In a world where the photon and the W had no mass at all, these two forces would be sort of the same. And that, the Nobel Prize for that idea was given to Abdus Salam and Glashow and uh, Weinberg uh, 20 or 30 years ago. But in the real world, the W boson is very massive, not massless. So what is the symmetry and how does it all work and what's it got to do with Higgs? In truly empty space, that means not just the vacuum that we know, but in truly empty space, and we will see in a minute or two, it's not, but this is a theorist's universe. In truly empty space, the equations show that a photon would have no mass, which indeed is how it is, and the W boson would have no mass. You have there a beautiful symmetry, but it's an unstable symmetry. It's only true in empty space. And I can give you an example in the real world where the photon does have a mass, or appear to. It's when space isn't empty. If you have a plasma, now what a plasma is doesn't need to concern us, but I'll show you an example in a moment, not literally. <laughs> when, a when an electromagnetic wave hits a plasma and goes through the plasma, a plasma, I'll tell you, is rather than the, the nuclei and the electrons being locked to make individual atoms, the nuclei are locked, but the electrons can flow pretty well everywhere, it's like a charged gas. And when an electromagnetic wave propagates through that, funny things happen and the photon acts as if it has a mass. So that is a phenomenon that is known in the real universe. Have a plasma, and the photons will appear to have a mass. So the simple idea, in quotes, is to say, let's suppose that the universe is filled with something else. Let's call it a Higgs plasma, whatever that is. So that when W bosons propagate through the Higgs plasma, they appear to have a mass. Now, this is the point when you think, is this scientist going crazy and you know, what point do I stop believing this? Uh, let me show you the ideas behind this. And it's this. So the real world, what happens when an electromagnetic wave hits a plasma? Now the ionosphere above us is an example of a plasma. And um, those of us of a certain age used to be able to listen to good old fashioned radio. And occasionally the following thing would happen. You would pick up a radio signal from New York. Now, that signal hadn't gone through the curvature of the Earth. It had been heading out into space. And then it had hit the ionosphere and been reflected back. This is an example of what happens when a low-frequency electromagnetic wave hits a plasma. It can't get in. It bounces back. So you hear the New York radio signal because that is a low-frequency electromagnetic wave but you can still see the stars shining through. They are shining in visible light, which is a high frequency electromagnetic wave. So 
This is an example of how a plasma will happily accept high frequency waves but not low frequency. So let's just do the one diagram in this talk. The green represents the plasma. The red at the top is a low frequency wave arriving and failing to get in. And below is a high frequency wave arriving and happily going through. Now we do the leap of imagination. Suppose that you were a creature that lived inside that plasma. Your experience of electromagnetic waves would be this. You wouldn't know of any low frequency ones. You would only know of high frequency ones. There would be a minimum frequency. It's called the plasma frequency, but there would be a minimum frequency. So here is this creature living inside the plasma for centuries and centuries, and they build science. And they build quantum theory of these electromagnetic waves with a minimum frequency. And they discover the idea that frequency is proportional to energy, E equals H nu. So this says that in the plasma, these plasma creatures think that photons have a minimum energy. Now, the only things that can have a minimum energy are things with mass. That's mc squared. If the energy can go all the way down to zero, the mass can go all the way down to zero. But if you've got a mass, there's a minimum energy. That's the energy you have when you're at rest. So the creature inside the plasma would perceive electromagnetic waves to come in little quantum bundles with mass. Now, of course, we know what's going on. We're sitting outside and say, ah, oh, you're just fooling yourself. Really, it's the wave propagating along and it hits the plasma and it's the interaction with the plasma that's doing it. But that's because we live outside and we can see what's going on. The creature inside the plasma doesn't know that. They will interpret this as a massive photon going through. But this is a very clever creature because he decides there's a way of experimentally testing this and that's this. The plasma, if you just hit it with just the right frequency, you can make a resonance, like in the old days, again, Friday night is bath night. Nowadays you have showers, but we used to be able to get in a bath and push up and down, and you would see the water resonate with you. Likewise here, if you hit the plasma with just the right frequency of energy, the whole plasma will recoil and oscillate. A plasma wave, which in quantum theory, acts like a particle called a plasmon. And that is all for real. That has been well known. And that is the idea that Higgs and friends then picked up on. The vacuum that we know is not empty. Let us suppose it is filled with a Higgs plasma. We now know that's true, because if you hit it with just the right frequency, you can excite the Higgs plasma wave, and in particle physics, that becomes a particle a Higgs-on, or the Higgs boson. So we are creatures that live inside this weird plasma. And we now know it because we've excited it and found the boson that proved that it was there. The W boson that we interpret as having a mass is because it is affected by this plasma. It's completely analogous, except there will be some people here saying, just a second, I was told that the ether disappeared some way back in Einstein's time and this guy has just reinvented it. Yes and no. This is why what these people did is clever. And to show that I've not made this up, this is Peter Higgs's paper in 1964, and in the, in the red box, this phenomenon, which we now call the Higgs mechanism, is just the relativistic analogue of the plasmon phenomenon. The plasma, the plasma example I gave you was originally done by Phil Anderson in 1962, two years before Higgs, Kibble and everybody else did their work. But what they did was to show how to take this idea and make it satisfy relativity. That was the key feature. But the basic idea that when you have a, a stuff, plasma, call it what you will, electromagnetic waves propagating through, if they interact with the stuff, will appear to be carrying mass. And that is the basic idea behind this. It's the basic idea. But how does it apply to the real world? Because in the real world, W bosons have mass, but photons don't. Now, Angler and Brout, who sadly uh, died a year or so ago, and Peter Higgs, among others, independently in 1964, discovered the mathematical trick of giving masses to such things if you imagine this plasma stuff is there. 
It was three years later that Tom Kibble from Imperial College showed how you could take this basic idea and make it work in the real universe. These guys who shared the Nobel Prize this year discovered how to give mass to things. Tom Kibble showed how to keep the photon massless. And so for me, that was why I included Kibble with um, Anglais and Higgs. But I think actually the Nobel Committee were very profound and wise because by giving it only to Higgs and Anglais, I think they were implicitly recognising that Robert Brout, who had done the work with uh, Anglais, who died two years ago, was sort of being recognised uh, by the omission of the third person, which, if so, I think that was quite, quite right. So, to conclude, because of Higgs Anglais, we know why the W boson is massive. And because the W boson is massive, we know why the force that keeps the sun burning is very feeble, and that the sun has lasted for five billion years, therefore, enabling evolution to happen. If the W boson had been massless, the sun would have burnt out within a million years and we wouldn't be here. So this is not just arcane, it is very relevant to things. What we don't know, I mean, it's all very well saying that these particles gain mass. Why the proton should be lighter than the neutron is a mystery. But it's very important that it is because the proton is positively charged and is the seed for the hydrogen atom. If the neutron was lighter, there'd be nothing there to grip things. If you ask a student, would you expect the neutron to be lighter than the proton all the way around? They would probably say, oh, the proton will be heavier because it's like a neutron but with electrostatic energy. And yet it's not like that. Nature is the other way around. We don't know why. But what we do know, I think now, as I said at the start, is why Rutherford's atom has the structure it does. The mass of the electron gives the size. The mass of the quarks gives the compact centre. So 100 years after Rutherford's nuclear atom was discovered... Higgs, Anglais have found the explanation of why that structure is there, which is why I nominated them for chemistry. And so uh, to draw the analogy to end with, the Higgs field, I say, is like the ocean. If it was completely placid, you would not know that it was there. But if you put the right amount of energy in, waves start to appear and you would begin to see the ocean at work. And the Higgs field, when things interact with it, they gain mass and give rise to structures like um, starfish and sandcastles and maybe future scientists. So that's the end of the lopsided universe. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just leave this up on the screen while you're asking questions that the next thing will be happening is Atom, which is Abingdon on Thames in Oxfordshire in March, anybody within the vicinity of that, the first uh, science and technology festival in the heart of where the British and international physics and science labs are, is going to be taking place. So uh, if you're within reach, please check it out. There are some people in the audience who will be appearing at it, so they want somebody to be there. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, Frank. We have time for questions. Now, there's two microphones that are going to circulate and um, you need um, if you want to ask a question to put your hand up, wave it, we've got a question over here and then when you have the microphone stand up please and ask your question, try and be brief with it so that we can get a number of questions over there please thank you thank you very much Professor Close for such an interesting lecture um, Please excuse my ignorance if, if this question doesn't make much sense, but um, from, from, from your lecture, are you telling us, well, d does nothing exist? <laughs> so is there such a thing as a vacuum based on now our discovery of the Higgs part? The brief answer is uh, a vacuum is not empty. Um, even apart from being filled with the Higgs field, whatever, whatever it is, it's filled with gravitational fields, electromagnetic fields, and in quantum mechanics it's bubbling in and out of particles and antiparticles all the time. So the vacuum is actually a medium, and it can change its structure, and it's a very interesting medium. It is not totally empty. Hands, please. Right at the back. Right at the back. <coughs> On the left. Thank you. Does that connect with um, dark energy or dark matter or anything like that? 
Uh, very interesting question, and it wasn't planted. I mean, I, I thought somebody might ask that. So, <laughs> that is what we know about dark matter. <laughs> um, we, we know that there's more stuff around than shines because the way that the galaxies behave shows there's much more gravitational tug than we could otherwise account for. So there appears to be either something fundamentally flawed in our understanding of uh, Newton's laws, which, you know, one cannot totally eliminate that, in my opinion. There are people who persevere with that line. Or that there's a lot of stuff which doesn't shine in any electromagnetic wavelength, but is manifesting itself by its gravity. We call it dark matter for that reason. And it's possible you could get two for the price of one. Because one thing I didn't say, and I thought some chemists here might raise it, is that there is an asymmetry between left and right in the weak force. That w Nature is a weak left-hander. Neutrinos go one way and not the other. <laughs> it is possible that all of these things come together. That when you look on the balance, that the neutrinos that we know are very lightweight things. Maybe there are very massive right-handed versions of them that we haven't yet found. And that would be another example of a massive unsymmetry. We've seen this bit. And those things are waiting to be found. And if they are found, then they indeed could be things with the right property to build up the dark matter, because neutrinos could be dark matter, but for one thing, they're lightweight, flighty, flit around quickly. The modelling that cosmologists do of galactic structures appear to want massive neutral things rather than lightweight neutral things. So the possibility that all of these things could fall into place is exciting. If that is the case, we will hopefully find examples of these dark particles at CERN when it starts up again uh, next year. Frank, I think we all want to know what the next answer you have on uh, your uh, computer. <laughs> that was in case some detailed physicists wanted to know what this had to do with the Higgs mechanism. But, uh, right, <laughs> somebody is waving. Right. Yes, it's just worth mentioning um, the, the thing, developing the theme a little bit that you mentioned. The, the, weak, uh, the weak force violates parity. Mm. It makes an absolute distinction between right and left-handed spin polarised uh, particles in <coughs> various interactions. It's just worth mentioning that um, the, the, the weak interaction infiltrates to a tiny extent into yes. all electromagnetic processes, so it infiltrates into the everyday world. This is something that came out of the, um, you know, the <coughs> unification of the weak and the electromagnetic interaction. And that infiltration, it generates a very tiny energy difference between left and right-handed chiral molecules like amino acids. Mm. And uh, Abdus Salam, in the last few years of his life, got very interested in this, and he thought perhaps this, he discovered that the secret of life, why we're all made of L amino acids rather than D, and blah, blah, blah. <coughs> uh, th there's a, a sort of a huge industry has developed over several decades trying to show that this... Um, this interaction, this, this parity violation and lifting of the degeneracy, you know, is why we have homo chirality in life, we're all L and rather than D. It's a lovely idea, but there's no experimental evidence mm. for it at all so far. It, there's no question it exists. You can compute it ab initio to within an order of magnitude, but it's very tiny. And there are now many more mundane mechanisms which can show how you can get a complete um, excess of one hand over the other with, with chiral molecules. So that just develops your theme just a mm. little bit. I was actually going to ask you a question. Has this huge industry succeeded yet? <laughs> well, no. Yeah. No. I mean, that, that they compute it quite accurately, but there's no experimental evidence. Um, yes. I mean, I'll, let, I'll let, me actually, let me just sort of ask a question back to people in the, in the audience. So I, I'm a bit beyond my pay grade here, but I think the following thing is certainly true. That the energy difference between the, the left-handed and right-handed forms is triflingly small on the scale even of room temperature. So I always feel it would be completely washed out. I mean, it's an interesting thing if you did a precision experiment, it would be washed out in, in reality. But the question isn't that these things don't exist. I mean, L and R do exist. It's just that life only makes use of one of them. And that is the, the issue for me. Why, why does life, why does only one of them procreate? Well, it, well. It's, it's because once one gets started, it, it, it takes over. It could mm. have been in the early days there were 
both it was life based on both you know left and right yes. amino acids but once one gets going it takes over um, and life has to be based on homochiral <sighs> chemistry it's like with engineering once you establish a convention of you know left-handed or whatever it is right-handed bolts you have to have right-handed nuts to go on it and it's like the um, <coughs> you know that look looking glass milk it's right. not good yes. to drink because it's the wrong handedness your enzymes won't uh, touch I'm it so. i'm feeling like a right-handed nut but the uh, <laughs> so, so it actually it is an example in your opinion then of what, what i'm saying it is uh, a slight dominance becomes an unstable symmetry which becomes a stable unsymmetry yeah. thank you i think in the middle here You were talking about how the Higgs field would stop um, <coughs> the sort of the longer wavelengths of the W boson from propagating through it, but um, now at the, the W boson is of course related to the Z boson and gamma and everything. But I was wondering how the Higgs field and gravity might interact and if they do and if we know how and if any research is being done into it. Right, I will, I should have held up a party card which says I don't do gravity. <laughs> <laughs> the understanding of gravity uh, is very tricky and I'm very happy as a particle physicist that I'm able to ignore it in practice. <laughs> Because although gravity is very powerful when it's acting on you know, mega things like the size of the Earth, at the level of individual atoms, it's so triflingly small we can neglect it. So I hope that got me out of uh, the second part of your question, but it's a, it's a good question. Why is it that the Higgs field affects W bosons and Z bosons and not photons? We don't know. Tom Kibble showed how you can create the mathematical description with those properties... But why it is those properties and not some other properties, they are, if you like, put in by hand. And indeed, why is it that the weak interaction is left-handed, whereas everything else doesn't care? We put that in by hand. And to my mind, I think, to me, the two immediate questions that are left hanging after all of this is, why are weak interactions intrinsically left-handed? And why do the pattern of masses turn out as they are? I mean, if the proton was heavier than the neutron, we wouldn't be here. But we put that in by hand. So I think we have found the in-principle way it all works, but the details of it, that is what makes science exciting. That is what future generations, and maybe you and your colleagues, will have the chance to answer. And I hope I'm around here to see the answers. But at the moment, it's open. I think there's somebody, but I can't see them. Okay, what's over there? And there's one over here, is there somewhere? Hello. Find it. A you bit of first. a metaphysical one, if um, it may be permitted. Um, I was struck that across your talk, you posed a number of unanswered why questions. Um, so I wonder if you'd be able to explain why it's meaningful to ask um, why, for instance, a subatomic particle has one property and not another. Uh, must there always be a reason? Um, is the universe not allowed to have uh, properties that are perhaps just arbitrary and irreducible? Um, the last question is one, if I'd had another 10 minutes, I, I threw some slides away. But um, one, one of the slides, well, maybe this example we have here, you know, that uh, snowflakes, let me just jump a second, that when you melt snow, you get a nice bowl of water and you can look at the surface of the water and it's rotation symmetric. Then you freeze it and you get a snowflake. And maybe the snowflake is sixfold with the dendrite pointing at 12 o'clock or maybe at 1 o'clock or some other angle. It is possible to draw an analogy that there was some sort of meta-universe around before the Big Bang, whatever those words mean, and that when it sort of froze, it froze and made the snowflake this way, which is the one that we happen to be in. And maybe there are other freezings, other ways, which have particles and forces with different properties. That is one possible further example that actually our universe, in a sense, is another stable unsymmetry. And that on the average, the true symmetry is averaged out between our universe and lots of others. But you read a lot about these things. Um, Valerie's here, the new scientists love these sort of things. 
Whether they are science or not is a question which I find actually quite difficult coming to terms with. If you could do an experiment to test whether there are other universes out there with different properties, then in a sense, by definition, it's part of our universe. If it's another universe, you can't test it experimentally. And where I came in at the start is it's experiment that decides. You can have wonderful theories, but if experiment cannot decide in principle, it might even be science. I'm going to ask you how you define science, but I guess that's where you'd go. I think it's a wise thing to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say no anyway. <laughs> now, I think somebody else was um, asking something in the middle. No? There, well, there's one up here. Please. No, I was actually going to ask something very similar to what he was asking was, how much of this can you or would you attribute to the anthropic principle or do you...? <laughs> uh, where's John Barrow? <laughs> ask him. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit cowardly, don't you think? <laughs> OK. Um, I, I really don't know. I mean, the... This is one of these questions which I don't see how to approach it in an experimentally testable way. Um, my mind has gone suitably blank. In a parallel universe, I've answered your question and been <laughs> incredibly impressive, but not the universe I'm currently in. I mean, in a sense, you know, if the particles did have different properties, we wouldn't be here having this discussion. But to me, that's all seemed a bit of a cop-out. On the other hand, that might be how it is. Um, I mean, the question which is perhaps nearer to this is, are these masses and properties, in a sense, fundamental and that there is some reason for them that we can find? Or are they accidental in the sense like the, the radii of the planets, the, the planetary orbits? You know, some hundreds of years ago, people were looking for some simple algorithm that would explain the planetary orbits. Of course, we today know that they're, in a sense, accidental. Now, are the particle masses like the planetary orbits and accidental, which might be anthropic, I, I don't know, or is there a fundamental symmetry behind the scenes which will reveal these numbers? Well, I don't know the answer to that at the moment. But if the answer to the latter is yes, then it's, then it's not anthropic. We are here because of it being like that. I, I would say, and again, you know, there are biologists and people here who worry about these things, so I'll just throw my six pennyworth in, that... I don't think anybody has shown that if the particle masses were different, that you could not have living things. We know that certain processes in the universe, as we experience it, would not happen. But I don't know that anybody has proved that you couldn't have consciousness with a whole different set of parameters. In fact, I don't know that anybody even understands what consciousness is. I mean, a question I would put in an audience like this, what is the minimum number of atoms I need before they know that they are there? to stop there actually but, um, <laughs> but there's one more we'll hear uh, that. Uh, John Barrow oh. <laughs> I, I think one thing's worth saying that Could if one's up? talking Could, about you um, stand up, John, if one's good. talking about predictions from the early universe of things that affect life then because of uh, knowledge that the universe has this quantum complexion we shouldn't expect that they would be completely sharp and specific, they will have a probabilistic nature. And if your predictions have that statistical character, then you have to start asking, well, what's the probability distribution of outcomes that you expect? Um, and what do you then compare observation with? And you might think, well, I'll compare it with the prediction of the most probable outcome. But if the most probable outcome is one that doesn't allow life to uh, evolve and persist, that would not be what you would test your theory against. So if you don't have an understanding of how the existence of life uh, is affected by different possible outcomes of a probabilistic uh, prediction, you will draw the wrong conclusions from it. So it's just a methodological mm. principle the anthropic principle, you know, if you don't uh, appreciate there are selection effects that might affect your experiment, you will draw wrong conclusions from it. If you don't appreciate there are uh, selection effects imposed by our existence on some probabilistic collection of outcomes, then uh, you'll draw wrong conclusion again. The big 
problem, I guess, is telling, you know, which are the things that have the probabilistic outcomes. Um, so if you were Kepler in 1600, you thought the number of planets in the solar system was absolutely fundamental law of nature. Uh, now, no planetary astrophysicist in their right mind would try to predict the number of planets in the solar system. It's absurd, like trying to predict the number of cars that go past in the next five minutes. It's just a random outcome. Mm -hmm. And we don't know whether some of these fundamental numbers of physics may not be random outcomes of one of your very deep processes. So well, that's why it's a good game to play. It's a good game to play. I, I'll just say one thing. One thing about the anthropic principle, I think that there is an accident that enables us to be here. The fact that three alpha particles can make... I mean, how is carbon made? The fact that there is a resonance level in carbon in just the right place. I mean, that was what I think Fred Hoyle predicted. It's probably the only time in nuclear physics that somebody predicted the existence of a resonance state by the fact that the improbability for life to happen. Now, a nuclear physicist, to calculate that that thing is in just the right place, it's a combination of a whole lot of things. It's like the planetary orbits. I would say it's pretty well an accident. So to me, that's the nearest thing to say that actually we are here because of an accident. And I don't like that, but that's probably how it is. OK. I am going to stop it there. I'm going to um, thank Frank. I think what we've heard this evening is um, the reason why we need the Michael Faraday lecture, because what we actually need are scientists who can communicate to the public. It's so important um, that um, we are engaged with society and... Um, telling the public about science is one of the important ways of doing, uh, uh, important ways of engaging. And the Michael Faraday lecture is meant to recognise it, so it tells us this is important. But it also tells us, um, with what we've heard tonight, why Frank Close is such a worthy uh, winner of the award of this lecture, because he has given us. Um, a very lucid lecture, as we've heard, about a very difficult subject, and he's also made us laugh, too. <laughs> and I think combining all that is difficult. We've seen how it's done. We've got a master in science communication here tonight. And I just want to thank you and congratulate thank you, you on your lecture tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Can we move out there? Yeah. Out the front. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now we we have a, a presentation because. Um, Poor as the society is, we do manage to um, put together a scroll. Thank you. A medal, a very oh. nice medal. Thank you. And a check. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.